Iron Hans is one of the most important fairy tales because it deals with the warrior archetype and its relationship to the worst of the human experiences war that we will explore in this lecture. It complements Cinderella that I presented in the last series as perhaps the most important fairy tale dealing with archetypal feminine or yin energy. So we've gotten to the point in the fairy tale where the prince, older now, has started over from the bottom doing grunge work in the kitchen of the new kingdom, only to be expelled for not taking his bandana off his head in the presence of the king. This was absolute bottom, but because he elicited pity from the cook, an act of grace for the young man, he ends up with the domesticated connection to nature, gardening, and not the wild nature of the wild man's haunts. The princess sees his golden hair by accident, but the prince refuses to consciously reveal it to her. His shadow work must be done first, which is what happens next in the tale and where we are seeing his fundamental connection to the wild man. So the fairy tale continues. Not long afterwards, the country was overrun by war. The king gathered together his people and did not know whether or not he could offer any opposition to the enemy, who was superior in strength and had a mighty army. Then said the gardener's boy, I am grown up and will go to the wars also, only give me a horse. The others laughed and said, seek one for yourself when we are gone. We will leave one behind for you in the stable. When they had gone forth, he went into the stable and led the horse out. It was lame of one foot and limped oblity jig, oblity jig. Nevertheless, he mounted it and rode away into the dark forest. When he came to the outskirts, he called Iron Hans three times so loudly that it echoed through the trees. Thereupon, the wild man appeared immediately and said, what do you desire? I want a strong steed, for I am going to the wars. That you shall have, and still more than you ask for. Then the mild man went back into the forest, and it was not long before a stable boy came out of it, who led a horse that snorted with its nostrils and could barely be restrained. And behind them followed a great troop of warriors, entirely equipped in iron, and their swords flashed in the sun. The youth made over his three-legged horse to the stable boy, mounted the other, and rode at the head of the soldiers. So when he got near the battlefield, a great part of the king's army had already fallen, and little was wanting to make the rest give way. Then the youth gathered thither with his iron soldiers, broke like a hurricane over the enemy, and beat down all those opposed him. They began to flee. But the youth pursued and never stopped until there was not a single man left. Instead of returning to the king, however, he conducted his troop by byways to the forest and called forth Iron Hans. What do you desire? asked the wild man. Take back your horse and your troops and give me my three-legged horse again. When the king returned to his palace, his daughter went to greet him and wished him joy for the victory. I'm not the one who carried away the victory, said he, but a strange knight came to my assistance with soldiers. The daughter wanted to hear who the strange knight was, but the king did not know and said, he followed the enemy and I did not see him again. She inquired of the gardener where the boy was, but he smiled and said, he just came home on his three-legged horse and the others have been mocking him, crying, here comes Hoblity Jig back again. They asked, too, under what hedge have you been lying sleeping all the time? So he said, I did the best of all and would have gone badly without me. And then he was still more ridiculed. So note that the prince can profess his importance, but not show it. He rides the hobbled horse. This is still hex line two and hexagram one, which I mentioned in the last lecture. So we can think of the invasion as the older order from the first kingdom trying to reestablish itself. In therapy, we call this negative restoration of the ego, 
after one retreats from the fight, the fright and or the amount of energy, courage and determination it would take to address the depths of one's complex. And as I said, the first kingdom uh, represents the problem and the second kingdom is the kind of heroic journey that one has to go on or peoples have to go on to address the problem and uh, restore balance. So we see the basic human experience, what archetype the wild man represents, the warrior archetype, especially in men. In the first kingdom, this energy was repressed and then suppressed and held in check by the mother, which made it even wilder, more dangerous and more frightening. A dream of a young male college student in his early 20s illustrates this. I'm walking besides Lake Mendota, that's the big lake next to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I see some African-American males and I'm scared. I begin to climb a nearby cliff and see an old man from the east meditating. I climb higher and see a bull in a boat on the lake, battering himself against the side of the boat. He had, uh, that was a dream. Then he had common associations to young African-American males, overtly and aggressive sexually and physically. And the man had recently entered a meditation group and the dream shows his way of avoiding facing his shadow by going up to the spiritual dimension. This is a spiritual bypass, an attempt to pass over and above and not deal with difficult issues. So this is from Jung, right? Or from your client? I gave a, a free hour of dream work when I taught the introductory course. And this is a man who came with, the, with this dream and we only had one hour and this is the dream we worked. So another way of going up and distancing from the body is to go into the intellectual realm, easy to do in academia. Notice what happens in the dream. The instinctual primal energy in the human domain gets even more primal. It devolves into the animal realm and becomes an angry bull. The boat on the water can be thought of as one's ego in relation to the unconscious. There is an urgency for the young man to deal with his energy and Iron John provides an archetypal framework for that. And this actually relates to Jung's basic critique of Christianity that by not being able to deal with the body and sensuality and sexuality and the erotic feminine and so on, it really gets worse. And when you bring religion into the mix, the bad becomes evil uh, and the good becomes too bright. And this is where I think Jung was heavily influenced by uh, Chinese thought and that yin yang symbol where things are always complementary and in balance instead of being driven to the extremes, which become good and bad. Better said, Christianity drives it to the perfectly good and the evilly bad. So another example was a man I worked with for several years in his 40s. He was blocked in his ability to express anger and his mother was terrified at the anger of her alcoholic husband and tightly controlled any expressions of anger in her son. The key was under her pillow. My analysis suffered from alcohol issues in college and turned to Eastern thought, marijuana, and excessive use of the I Ching, all symptoms of not being able to escape the mother realm. So the prince is grown up now and his full adult consciousness would be represented by the three good legs on the horse. The hobbled fourth leg represents what must be dealt with to achieve wholeness, the missing fourth. Think of the three type psychological functions we have to varying degrees of conscious control and the inferior fourth, the hobbled leg, as being the most distant from consciousness. So the iron swords flashing in the sun would be the archetypal masculine aspect of making strong, firm, sharp, conscious sun, if you will, discriminations and severing one thing from another with male initiations being but one example. So we had hints of the nature 
of the shadow of the wild man in the first kingdom. He had long, wavy, rust-colored hair, rust being an oxide of iron. His nature was deadly, and the birds of prey were associated with war, and that was part of the gestalt of the forest. In the second kingdom is weakness in the face of war and the energies associated with the Greek god Ares. So mythographer Robert Graves has this to say about Ares. Thracian Ares loves battle for its own sake, and her sister Eris is always stirring up occasions for war by the spread of rumor and the inculcation of jealousy. Like her, he never favors one city or party more than another, but fights on this side or that as inclination prompts him. Delighting in the slaughter of men and the sacking of towns. Athena was a much more skilled and strategic fighter than Ares. So the prince's mad, intense action, like a hurricane, and the pursuit of the enemy till every last one was slain, was to be gripped by the Ares archetype. This can also happen with a person's first full engagement with shadow energy. Its primal nature can be frightening, which keeps many from going near it in the first place. Jung recalled experiences of mad, vengeful anger in the famous face-to-face -face interview. He said he could have killed the teacher he hated if he had met him in a dark corner, the teacher who didn't believe he had written an excellent essay. Then Jung said, I would have been capable of violence, I know. I was a bit afraid of it, so I rather tried to avoid crucial situations because I didn't trust myself. Once I was attacked by about seven boys and I got mad and I took one and just swang him round by his legs, you know, and beat four of them. And then they were satisfied. So the positive aspect of the prince's Aries-like behavior is that it protected and defended the boundary of the kingdom a kingdom now associated with an anima figure. Recall that the anima is a step beyond and separate from the mother who had a strong influence on its nature. Boundary setting and defense of same are attributes of masculine yang energy helping separate from the engulfing aspects of the mother-child bond with the help from the father as the first other. So recall the Charles Santray case, when he came to the painful realization that he had considered himself and his mom to be one. So the prince was able to ask for help in a war situation and became totally identified with the fury the wild man can represent and was able to exit that archetypal stance and humbly return to humanity. Note that the princess was suspicious who the mysterious knight was. I think another way of saying it is the unconscious knows. So Ares and the subject of war opens us to one of the ugliest and most troublesome aspects of human nature, and therefore one of the most important to explore. War is normal and archetypal because of its relentless presence in the eyes of humankind since its very beginnings. The Greeks and the Romans experienced the gods as something that happens to them. What happens to us when Ares, as the god of war, possesses us? We feel archetypal energy of battle rage that carries us to see red, go berserk, become completely fearless, and experience oneself as being immortal. This inhuman power is wild, blind, untamable excessive, insane, bloody, swift, sudden, wanted, obscene, savage, destroyer, supernaturally powerful, fierce passion. So many veterans speak of the intense camaraderie and bonding formed in war and of combat as the most uniquely intense experiences of their lives. Uh, today is uh, June 6th, the 80th um, memorial of D-Day, and I always get a little emotional on this day. Uh, I was born about four months before D-Day, 
And my father was, after fighting in France, was on a boat in Marseille to be shipped off to for the invasion of Japan. And then they dropped the atomic bombs. Otherwise, I might not have grown up with a father. So Hillman, with his usual brilliance, writes in a terrible love of war, quote, unless we enter into the martial state of mind, we cannot comprehend its pull. Any phenomenon to be understood must be empathetically imagined. To no war, we must enter its love. No psychic phenomena can be truly dislodged from its fixity unless we move the imagination into its heart. So Chris Hedges claims that war is a force that gives us meaning because it does what religion is supposed to do raise our lives into importance or imminence. He goes on to say, ceremonies of military service, the coercion by in obedience to a supreme command, the confrontation with death in battle as a last rite on earth, war's promise of transcendence and its sacrificial love, the test of all human virtues and the presence of all human evils, the slaughter of blood victims impersonally, collectively in the name of a higher cause and blessed by ministers of several faiths, all drive home the conclusion war is religion. Yet that conclusion provides little for fresh thought. We need to pass beyond what we know to imagining what we may not want to know. War is religion takes us only halfway. Beyond is a far graver proposition. Religion is war. This is the second part of Hillman's argument. It is very profound, so I will repeat it. Religion is war. So what does that mean? Hillman points out that whatever the object of belief, whether it be the flag, the nation, the president, or the god, martial, energy mobilizes. Hillman goes on, when the claims of any divinity or a semi-divinized leader like Hitler or an abstracted idea of, of a people, a class, a race, or a nation is believed to be the prime reality, truth, goodness, and power, it will fight against the claims of all others to the same rank and status. Toleration is compromising, inclusion treacherous, coercion to the point of violence is necessary. So a significant move beyond this trap is to realize that belief posits the reality of its object, whereas myth never asserts that the gods are real. That was the Greek idea is that the gods and goddesses were these archetypal energies that take us over or possess us. There's not really a God out there in heaven, but these are archetypal stances that, that we can become possessed by. So Hillman reminds us of a positive aspect of Aries or Mars, uh, and it's that that defends the city, civilization itself, and stands and fights for justice, gives courage, has a mighty heart, is tireless, and hard with spear driving home point with superior force. So war defends civilization, Hillman points out, by overcoming evil, repelling barbarians, protecting the innocent, but in a way that the entry into war and the contact, uh, conduct of war maintains the steadfast virtue of Mars. To be courageously honest, to be in mind of civilization, its history, its frailty, when, however, the martial spirit is confined within any single-minded belief, the result is domination, intolerance, and suppression of other ways of being, and we suffer the horror of war from which we seek to escape. So the archetype itself suggests a way out, that being the love affair between Ares and Aphrodite, both as passionate archetypal beings. This is a gestalt where Aphrodite can modify and redirect Ares' warlike energy. And this is what is happening in our fairy tale. 
the prince was possessed by the berserk wild and a wild man uh, Aries energy but now in his relationship to the princess that energy is going to be modified and cultured and put to good use so Aphrodite is the goddess of love beauty and sexuality the erotic also the goddess of relatedness eros love and relationship to a particular one so relatedness is the entree to discovering the common ground of our humanity we must imagine our ways into the hearts and minds and lives of the so-called enemy to see ourselves even through their eyes so Hillman notes that if peace is merely an absence of a freedom from war, it is both an emptiness and a repression. A psychologist must ask, how is this emptiness filled? Since nature abhors a vacuum, and how does the repressed return as it must? So one possibility that Catherine Sevla explores is the creation of a culture of peace by reviving and more fully living the archetype of Aphrodite. She says, we could create cultural rites that propitiate the God of war as an active presence without entering and enacting Aries energy and honor and redirect the motivation and human qualities that are part of war's experience. Motivations, for example, like the call to preserve and protect, to eradicate an evil, to test yourself, to prove yourself, to be in service of something larger, for the intensity and aliveness, for the unity and the sense of belonging. Sevla goes on, we could apply the qualities of the warrior, like courage, loyalty, discipline, strength, heroic service, to use in peacetime. Currently, our collective effort in peacetime is primarily to be part of yet another machine, to bring the best that we have and put it in the service of the ego of the corporate executive, to the quest for livelihood and this thing we call the economy, which we have turned into a god. Sevla asks, what if we made it a collective project to use Aries and Aphrodite energy in the pursuit of goals that fed our souls as well as our bodies and each of us actively and imaginatively engage in the shared project of culture building. She continues, this would give us a sense of purpose and belonging to the world and to each other. And that satisfies all of our human needs and not leave a peace vacuum like Aries will fill. Can we see each other and the world through the eyes of love and find a unifying image for cultures with heart, she asks. In the next lecture, I will develop the idea of Aries and Aphrodite energy as something that all of us and all cultures and all members of our species have to engage in a mutual project to address climate change and the damage to the environment because climate change and environmental damage is a species problem. It's not a Chinese problem, or American problem, or European problem. It's something our whole species has to do. And that's gonna take the courage and the determination and the passion of Aries and Aphrodite. So Hillman would add, war must be restrained by aesthetic passion and the making of culture by concentrated concentrated on making on the creative process. The making invites martial metaphors, slogging through and sticking it out, cutting, breaking, tending, rendering, suffering wounds in the feet, uncontrollable rage at obstacles, intermittent sleep, images, shapes, lines pop out of the darkness as to pickets on night watch, the verge of madness, the loss of self and the continual adventures into no man's land. So this is pure Hillman. Aesthetic intensity offers an equivalent to war by providing an uh, obdurate enemy, the image, the material, the idea, to attack, subdue, and convert. Venusian passion offers the erotics, the sacrifice, a devotion, but without doctrine, 
and a band of comrades dedicated to the same search for the sublime. As war is beyond reason and religious faith is beyond reason, so too must be the aesthetic parallel to war. So Hillman always comes back to the power of the imagination, of the creativity and the psyche and nature, and the power of image. And that's what he's trying to apply to this situation of war and the, the passion that it'll take to uh, not leave a war vacuum, a peace vacuum, if you will. And we're gonna need a lot of generativity and creativity and passion and working together, the arrows, to address our, our environmental issues as a species. In the talk I gave at the 10th International Conference on Analytical Psychology and Chinese Culture in December in Qingdao, I spoke about Hillman using Aphrodite as the soul of the world and beauty as a way of uh, reframing how we look at nature and the beauty and the, the beauty of the interconnectedness of everything in nature that the Greeks call the cosmos. So Margaret Mickleberg, in her review of Hillman's book, implores us to, quote, imagine a nature, a nation whose first line of defense is each citizen's aesthetic investment in some cultural form. All the diabolical inventiveness, the intolerant obsession, and the drive to conquer compelled toward culture. Would war lose some of its magic? Could a fierce coupling between Mars and the passion of Venus that in its fire and passion engender a new civilization with a robust appreciation for the arts and culture? My wife taught at a medical school in China, and she was so impressed by the Chinese medical students that could put on these uh, performances with their musical instruments and uh, create these paintings and so on. It just seemed a rather a natural part of Chinese culture that impressed her. So to segue back into our fairy tale, consider that Ares had a kind of virgin birth from the goddess Hera, from uh, the wife of Zeus, brought forth out of anger as Zeus's many infidelities. Uh, Ares was hated by all of the gods. Now, our tale is developing a different relationship between Ares and the feminine, emphasizing the Ares-Aphrodite romance. So the prince is using Ares energy in a positive way to protect and defend the boundaries of his new kingdom, where an anima figure is attracted to the hair emblazoned with the gold from Iron Hans Well. The prince is still at line two of hexagram one, bordering on line three, but like an artist working on a great painting, he has more private work to do before exposure to the public, to the forces of the collective values. He has more work to do to transform archetypal, his archetypal identity, identity with the wild man experienced in the battle into energies more available for conscious and humane use and direction. So in the next paragraph of the fairy tale we read, the king said to his daughter, I will proclaim a great feast that shall last for three days and you shall throw a golden apple. Perhaps the unknown man will show himself. When the feast was announced, the youth went out to the forest and called Iron Hans, what do you desire, asked he, that I may catch the king's daughter's golden apple. It is as safe as if it had been done already, said Iron Hans. You shall likewise have a suit of red armor for the occasion and ride on a spirited chestnut horse. When the day came, the youth galloped to the spot, took his place amongst the knights and was recognized by no one. The king's daughter came forward and threw a golden apple to the knights, but none of them caught it but he. Only as soon as he had it, he galloped away. So on the second day, Iron Hans equipped him as a white knight and gave him a white horse. Again, he had the only one who caught the apple and he did not linger an instant, but galloped off with it. The king grew angry and said, this is not allowed. He must 
appear before me and tell his name. He gave the order that if the knight who caught the apple should go away again, they should pursue him. If he would not come back willingly, they were to cut him down and stab him. So on the third day, he received from Iron Hans a suit of black armor and a black horse. And again, he caught the apple. But when he was riding off with it, the king's attendants pursued him. And one of them got near to him and he wounded the youth's leg with the point of his sword. The youth nevertheless escaped from them, but his horse leapt so violently that the helmet fell from the youth's head and they could see he had golden hair. They rode back and announced this to the king. So we see yet another threeness in this fairy tale. So the festival is a sign that we have moved into ritual space where deep transformations can occur. This relatively brief time outside ordinary consciousness is what Robert Bly and Iron Hans describes as a liminal space, intimate and imaginative, that connects us to our deeper selves, our anima and animus. We experience our inner emptiness and longing without filling it. So in other words, uh, the, the prince had this archetypal experience of Aries energy, but now that has to be processed with imagination and creativity, and that is what's connected with the anima. And this is how Robert Bly said it's done. A warrior can enjoy the beauty of his sacred warrior without engaging in battle. This is about slowing down, giving grace to movements and being for the warrior character in our tale developed in conflict to shine through and to be seen to be mirrored. Bly expressed it well. Ritual space, that would be the festival, carries the young man out of machismo, out of battle, out of dominator fantasies. Blake, William Blake, that is, called the highest stage of consciousness constant creativity or the shining city of art. So recall Hillman's comment on warrior energy and the creative process. The golden apples led him into the paradise of form. They're being led by ritual space away from war and toward community. The ritual space in our fairy tale heated by the holy feminine and king becomes hot enough to allow change. Warriorhood that has not been repressed or skipped over can modulate into beauty, delight, display, and art. So notice uh, for those of you that had the course uh, on fairy tale on Cinderella, this throwing out the apples and the prince retrieving them would be similar to Cinderella going to the ball and showing herself, but then escaping. So we are moving into line three of hexagram one and Wilhelm says, his fame begins to spread, the masses flock to him, his inner power is adequate to the increased outer activity, danger lurks here in the place of transition from lowliness to the heights. Many a great man has been ruined because the masses flocked to him and swept him away into their course. Ambition has destroyed his integrity. However, true greatness is not impaired by temptations. And that is a quote from page eight of the Wilhelm Baines translation of the I Ching. So Bly notes, the joy of the display pulls energy away that would otherwise be invested in conflict. And this is related, I think, to hexagram 22, P for grace, where it says, the beauty of form necessary in any union, if it is to be well-ordered and pleasing, rather than disordered and chaotic. So the strong essential of the sun is changed and given pleasant variety by the moon and the stars. Through contemplation of forms in human society, it becomes possible to shape the world. So to lure out the mysterious savior, the night savior of the kingdom, the princess throws out a golden apple. And Murray Stein in his excellent book, men under construction, one link this to the significance of the anima. He says, the mother stabilizes and contains his personality, 
while the dynamic anima motivates him to find his own unique direction in life. She demands liveliness, change, and further development while providing the energy and drive for the transformation. She demands a man make an unqualified commitment to himself and to his own life, which means leaving the security of mother and father. So the apple was loaded with symbolism. Significant in the creation or sacred space and ritual are its associations with immortality. Some young men went about to be sacrificed in the Greek ritual of Adonis were given a golden apple as a passport to paradise and the Celts imagined paradise to be an apple orchard in the West where death is. Adonis was famous in Greek mythology for having achieved immortality after being the mortal lover of the goddesses Aphrodite and Persephone. He was the ideal of male beauty in classical antiquity and considered to be a prime example of the archetypal dying and rising God. So other significant apple associations are with the earth, materialism, and totality because of its roundness. As an orb, it represents the kingdom on earth and embodiment of the spirit and association to the yin in the yin-yang symbol. And once you know it, it is associated with Aphrodite, which was Venus in Roman mythology, in relation to sexual enjoyment, fertility, and ritual copulation. So Eve's apple fruit given to Adam in the Garden of Eden has been imagined as the female sexual organ. Uh, apple is also associated with wisdom and knowledge, the product of the human challenge of living with our many dimensions of imagination, social interactions and systems atop the fundamental sex drives animals simply live out in driven instinctual form. So the apple is also associated with apple blossoms, springtime, and the gift to brides. I love apple blossoms. And to the apples in autumn as a symbol for a gift of immortality. So this is related to the color sequence of the great mother depicting the feminine mysteries of life and death. And here's a chart that summarizes it with the maiden associated with white, the new moon, spring, and a goddess of birth and growth, the nymph associated with red, and yes, Aphrodite, the full moon, summer and harvest, and the goddess of love and war, that's our fairy tale, and the crone associated with black, the old moon, winter, and late autumn, and the goddess of death and divination. Compare these to the four phases in any cycle of change in the I Ching, spring, which is supreme in Wilhelm, growth, success in Wilhelm, harvest, what Wilhelm calls furthering, and trial, perseverance, and associations with divination. So the alchemical sequence is black of the prima materia, the heaviness of lead, darkness and depression in our lives, the blackness of matter untouched by spirit or consciousness. The white, the albedo, is the abstract ideal state of things when they start to lighten as purification occurs in the imagination, in spirit, and in humor. And uh, this must be embodied in red, the rubedo, and brought to life with passion. This is more a second half of life sequence with a person wanting to move towards wholeness. So Bly calls the red, white, and black sequence of forces in our tale, the masculine sequence of wounding and growth. If a young woman begins with white innocence, a boy begins with red Aries Mars, best illustrated by the myth of Parsifal, which Jung considered to be the most significant myth of the West that emerged in the Middle Ages and from which Jung said, we have not moved beyond. So in hexagram four, youthful folly, Wilhelm comments, stopping in perplexity on the brink of a dangerous abyss is a symbol of the folly of youth. Folly is not an evil in youth. One may succeed in spite of it, provided one finds an experienced teacher and has the right attitude toward him. This means being conscious of one's lack of experience 
and showing receptivity to the teacher one sought out. Iron Hans was the prince's teacher. Bly remarks when Parsifal left his mother's house where there were no adult men, he is a clumsy, naive fool. Almost immediately, he kills the Red Knight and takes his armor. He himself becomes the Red Knight. How many misunderstandings he causes, how much rudeness and arrogance he has, much antisocial behavior he indulges in during his Red Knight time. But without the Red, Bly says, no white. So the White Knight in shining armor fights for the good and is no longer antisocial. The white knight in American culture is often unsufferable if it hasn't lived through the red. People like George Bush without real military experience got us into the Iraq war as a Christian nation to liberate Muslim people and bring democracy without knowing of the centuries old conflict between Sunni and Shia Muslims. It takes a long time for a man to move into the black, being humbled by withdrawing shadow projections onto bad men and women, communists, witches, and tyrants. Bly said, we need the three riding skills associated with the three horses we are given to quote, ride at various times in our, our lives, we fall off and get back on. The red phase can't be skipped. If a man didn't live through the red phase in adolescence, he will, quote, will have to come back to red later and be obnoxious when he is 40. So the three competitions for the golden apple can be seen as the prince processing, coming to terms with, and humanizing the wild man's shadow energy in ritual space presided over by the princess and king. Bly relates the leg wound inflicted when the prince tried to escape uh, after obtaining the third apple as an aspect of deliberate wounding the adolescent receives from older men during initiation. The physical pain embodies the psychological developmental pain of the separation from the nurturing, loving mother and the movement into the realm of the adult male. It is pain now with the support and love of men. The humiliation of having pain inflicted upon one by a more mature, wise, masculine energy humbles one and makes one more compassionate. The heroic white knight suffers the humbling pain of defeat and it makes him more human. Bly added, no one gets to adulthood without a wound that goes to the core. Here is another way to view the wound. Prior to the wound, the individual alone has some sense of his value and potential, but it is self-reflected. The anima as reflections gives glimpses of that from the world outside the individual. With three as a minimum number before going to the next step, the prince is in the difficult position to show himself and take on the challenge of manifesting his influence in the harsh world of reality. This is the transition from the lower trigram as the inner world to the upper trigram as the outer world. It's line three in hexagram one that says, there are all sorts of things to be done. And when others are at rest in the evening, plans and anxieties press upon him. Page eight in Wilhelm. This was Jung realizing he couldn't stay in his identity with God's world and had to go into the world of making money, raising a family, etc. It's also the transition from being a trainee in a Jungian program and switching chairs from being an analysis to that of being an analyst. And so we move to the end of the tale. The following day, the king's daughter asked the gardener uh, about the boy. He is at work in the garden. The queer creature has been at the festival too and only came home yesterday evening. And he has likewise thrown my children three golden apples, which he has won. So the king had him summoned into his presence and he came and again had his little cap on his head. But the king's daughter went up to him and took it off. And then his golden hair fell down over his shoulders. And he was so handsome, they were all amazed. Are you the knight who came every day to the festival? 
always in different colors, and who caught the three golden apples, asked the king. Yes, answered he, and here the apples are. And he took them out of his pocket and returned them to the king. If you can desire further proof, you may see the wound which your people gave me when they followed me. But I was likewise the knight who helped you to your victory over your enemies. If you can perform such deeds as this, you are no gardener's boy. Tell me, who's your father? Prince answered, my father is a mighty king, and gold have I plenty as great as I require. I will see, said the king, that I owe thanks to you. Can I do anything to please you? Yes, answered he, that indeed you can. Give me your daughter to wife. The maiden laughed and said, he does not stand much on ceremony, but I have already seen his golden hair, that he is no gardener's boy. And then she went and kissed him. His father and mother came to the wedding and went in great delight, for they had given up all hope of ever seeing their son again. And as they were sitting at the marriage feast, the music suddenly stopped, the door opened, and a stately king came in with a great retinue. He went up to the youth embraced him and said, I am Iron Hans, and was by enchantment a wild man. But you have set me free. All the treasures which I possess shall be your property. We have an image for the wedding here. So we have reached line five in hexagram one, where it says the great man has attained the sphere of heavenly beings. His influence spreads and becomes visible throughout the whole world. Everyone who sees him may count themselves blessed. So note that the prince declared the wild man to be his father and not his biological father. The people were amazed with his golden hair and how handsome he was. The gold was extracted from the dung. The positive side of the warrior archetype has been embodied and brought into consciousness for the good of the country. The wild man reveals that he was a bewitched king. His powerful energies had been distorted. The frightening aspects of the personal and the collective shadow have been related to and worked through. With the integration of the shadow, the prince has achieved full manhood and is therefore ready for union with the anima to be in a deep relationship with his unconsciousness as other and embody spirit to become his soul. So Coco, we can skip the last couple of slides that uh, kind of more detailed comparison I make between uh, Cinderella and uh, Iron Hans. And I'll go that uh, into that in the next lecture. But it's more, more important that we have some time for some questions and, and some responses here. Uh, so Dennis, this is a question from the beginning, almost the beginning of the presentation. So that is, you mentioned that he has to uh, dealing, he has to deal with his shadow work first, then move mm -hmm. on. So what does the shadow work refer to? The shadow work, uh, as I mentioned um, in the lecture for the prince was that deadly wild man energy appearing in this fairy tale as Ares or uh, Mars energy, the god of war and, and conflict. And uh, all those attributes of kind of like being insane and going berserk and so on. That's an archetypal energy. We have had wars forever as human beings. So it's, it's basic, it's archetypal. And to me, that's one of the really important dimensions of the tale is how do you relate to that energy? And can we as a species transform it? And that whole transformation was done in of uh, first of all, embodying it and living it out and knowing what that's like to experience it. And Hillman was saying that if we want to try to move beyond this archetype of war as a species, because every human being, especially males, know what that aggressive energy is like. And when it gets to that really distorted form, then it's deadly and that's what has to you have to relate to it and Hillman says we have to imagine our way into it we have to realize that there is a love of, of that energy and we're not going to get beyond that unless we can realize how powerful 
and how much love it is for men, especially to be in war. That's where you start. So this is an extremely important concept. The second part of that is the realization that war is, and the military is like a religion, like God is on your side, you're fighting to uh, save your people against some enemy, the enemy is demonized, but it's not just an enemy in war, it's anything that is ultimate value, your race or your country or your, your flag, we certainly see that in America, your ideas, uh, ideals, and so on. Those are all the ultimate. And the, the uh, danger is what we call othering, to make something other that you can fight and try to destroy. So the third part of it, of this transformation of this shadow energy, is the relationship with Aphrodite, uh, depicted mythologically as the affair that uh, Ares had with Aphrodite. So when you bring that Aries energy in t- into Aphrodite, Aphrodite is about not only sex and passion and so on, but also about Eros relatedness. So instead of Aries out there just being the superhero and slaughtering people just for the joy of it, it's like, whoa, now we've got to bring that energy into relatedness with other people. So that bring that courage and that determination and that passion to trying to understand other people and to uh, present your position in a strong way and have somebody from the other side present their position and engage in the combat of ideas and the, the gener- the artistic energies and creative energies that can be generated by a good conflict. I like to use the metaphor of like a championship basketball game that's going on now. The first game tonight because of my presentation, (laughs) but there's a, there'll be other games yet this week, but here you have the supremely uh, athletic men without helmets and stuff competing at the highest level and bumping and everything, but it's within a controlled environment. And the, they don't kill the, 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 the losers. They shake hands at the end. It was a good conflict, a good engagement. So to me, basketball is one of the models for how we humans can engage in intense competition. And it really elevates us, uh, but it has to be done within rules. That's what is so important. We saw that archetype in the uh, Super Bowl this year where Taylor Swift, one of the superstar female singers, is a girlfriend of one of the the star football players for the Kansas City Chiefs. So after the Chiefs won the Super Bowl, there is Taylor Swift coming down like in her fairy tale to give a big kiss as the Super Bowl trophy is about to be presented. And if there's any sport that comes close to gladiators and (laughs) people just about killing themselves. It's American football. Um, It's it's very violent. Oh, yes. I mean, um, people can get killed. They can be uh, paralyzed for life. Uh, They have injuries that they live with the rest of their life. It's a very, to me, it's a very American sport. Mm. Very different from basketball. You know, we have super developed athletes but they're not covered in helmets and all this padding and everything else it's a dangerous sport and of course that's what we're basically trying to do with analyzing fairy tales we're trying to develop an archetypal and symbolic perspective and that's how we can look at our culture and things like football games or the words and popular music and stuff like that there's a comment from Ping. she says that since the boy was mocked by others and because of uh, the poor, uh, poor horse he has. And uh, so it remains uh, us, it is uh, the inferior function. And uh, yeah, it also is embedded in, uh, uh, by the mighty, mighty arm in a later show. 
later oh. and he was given um by the of uh, the the mighty army by the every hand so she relates such great forces to the inferior function right right um it, to the inferior function because it's unconscious and the furthest from conscious control and if you denigrate or disrespect that energy and it's kind of the way it's gone in the west in many parts of the world uh, the the ma the male attitude toward the feminine so things like feeling values and relational type things that has been even in american culture now with our lot of liberated women that is still not given a lot of respect so when like uh, i'll speak from the male position and like the more thinking function and so on that when you don't honor and develop some relational ability if you will it gets separated off more and then in the man that's the traditional way Jungians talk about the anima it's this um the the man who gets very emotional and over sentimental and saccharine and that sort of stuff is because he uh, hasn't cultivated his relationship with the anima which tends to in kind of a traditional this is speaking very generically way uh, about the male female relationship and that to me is uh, the where it's a split would be like the yang side just total total white without that black dot in, in the middle and vice versa for the yin and that again is it relates to the german saying every man has a woman within that would be that black spot in the middle of the yang if you take the yang as more associated with the masculine and thinking and so on and the spirit so the next question is about uh the balance between the the good part and the negative the positive and the po negative part instead of us um and uh but they, in terms of the proportion, what's your idea? And she finds that if you, if it's a half and a half, it seems also problematic in uh, that is social relationships or yeah, they in social life. But in uh, her idea, maybe it's uh, the uh, three to uh, seven to three proportion is better. What's your idea? <laughs> Oh, that's an interesting, uh, interesting question. Where does one start with with that? I'm thinking of Jung talking about like the second half of life more, where he said it becomes a circumambulation around the self. So it, it, instead of 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 like moving out it in one direction and developing ego consciousness and all that sort of stuff and leaving so much behind that what you leave behind can be negative and turn dark as we see in uh as we saw in cinderella and iron hans i have a hard time thinking of it of it that way because in the then the second half of life the circumambulation about the self it's like you're always i think of it more like closer to the source that lao tzu talks about so there's always going to be this balancing and if one can relate to these subtle dimensions and messages from the unconscious like the chi energy then you don't get to these big imbalances the other thought that comes to mind is an idea in marriage counseling that every relationship uh, every spouse has a certain amount of uh, things that they do that are relationship destroying and um, in the marriage it's like there has to be enough good stuff to hold it together to the stuff that destroys the relationship so I think if I were looking for a percentage I would look to marriage counselors I think it's Gottman's idea to find out what percentage they came up with and I think that would be my answer to this, this person's question and it's not 51 to 49 
I think it's a little more like three to two. I don't think it's quite four to one, but I think it's around maybe three to two would be my guess. Three to two. Right. Three parts are good to two parts of the relationship destroying element. It probably it may be higher, maybe 80% to 20%, but that's where I would look. The last one is, and uh, since you mentioned about the shadow, the shadow work, can we understand that it uh, uh, represents the untamed anger, maybe represented by an adolescent boy who lose temper or did some things um, inappropriate? Yeah, that was exactly the point that Bly made so well. When I analyzed the fairy tale uh, before reading Bly's book, I didn't quite know what to make of that sequence of red, white, and black, because I was used to the alchemical sequence. So I really liked the way Bly talked about it. And, and you're entirely right that that red and that anger, uh, anybody who's raised an adolescent boy knows what that is like. You know, it's quick to anger, it's impulsive, it's pretty irrational, it's kind of stupid and clumsy, uh, all that sort of stuff. And you look at the ferocity of the sports, the high school sports, especially high school football, it's one way to get that energy out there in some kind of a contained form. But like Bly, the way I think of it and I presented it is that's what I think the initiation ceremonies are about. I think that's why they are so violent in a way and so frightening. And in Africa, some young men still die during the initiation ceremony. You have to channel that testosterone energy. And that's something women don't, young women don't have testosterone energy. So there is a difference in the sexes. And just one last comment to mean that that whole idea of pain and torture for the adolescent male part of the initiation. I had the good fortune of being able to attend many Native American sun dances, not as a dancer, but a supporter. And the boys in adolescence will often do the sun dance. And there's some pain. There's actually the skin is cut and they, they insert pegs beneath the skin and so on. And the, the, the young man has to endure that without crying or screaming out in pain. The women don't do that. And the idea is that for women, if you go by the biological natural base of women, that's the pain of childbirth, that incredible pain of delivering a baby. So for men, uh, like consciously have it inflicted by other men upon you and consciously enduring it, is very different from this is a force of nature. So the idea that women are more connected with the force of nature and birthing life, and that's, that's where their transformative pain is. So all that pain of childbirth and then, wow, this miracle of, a, of another human life. I must say one last thing about that in the archetypal and biological realm. As a biologist and having taught human biology, I'm very aware of the incredible difficulties the human female has in giving birth because of the way we evolved. And in the uh, creation story in the Bible, the woman is blamed for tempting Adam by giving him the apple. And I said in the presentation that one way is that's a sexual organ. Uh, she's blamed for it. And her punishment is the labor of, of uh, giving birth. So here you have this natural biological thing being framed as a punishment for women tempting men to have sex. That's how I interpret it. I actually I enjoy this part more than giving the lecture. I thank you and I will see you next week. So thank, thank you, you nice. Coco, for your wonderful you. work. Shay Shay. Thank you. We'll oh. see you next week. See you. Take care. Good night.